around the planet again, from the US, from Ireland especially. Our uh, today's speaker, Mary Redmond, uh, uh, is recording and talking from from Dublin today. I myself, uh, in, I am in Cologne in Germany, and uh, the rest of our team is uh, dispersed across uh, Italy and the continent. Um, this is the fourth edition of our um, online seminar, uh, um, converted into online mode uh, because of the cor coronavirus emergency. And uh, it's one of the very few positive side effects uh, that we are able to include a large number of interested scholars and people to uh, participate on this, uh, this seminar on digital and public humanities. Uh, this runs uh, until the summer. In June, please check our, our program on the website. And there is some noise in the back, so everyone, please put your microphones on mute. Um, otherwise, we have a, a VDPH police in the back who is able to put you on mute uh, and just to avoid um, disturbing noise. Before I... Uh, go on uh, and introduce to our chat today. Uh, I would like to give you some very general instructions how uh, our seminar works. So uh, Mary is going to give a presentation, uh, three, 30 minutes or a little bit more. Uh, and afterwards, you will have uh, a lot of time to uh, ask questions, make comments. Uh, and I would ask you to please Please post your questions into the chat, uh, which you can open by clicking in the upper right corner. There is a speech bubble uh, called chat, and there you can post your question in a concise manner, if possible. If you are not able to pose it that way, you can also just uh, raise your hand by uh, uh, stating you want to ask a question, and I will then uh, give you um, space to um, to uh, ask your question uh, by by voice so we this, this will be a mix of uh, me reading your questions or asking you to read your questions yourselves or to elaborate on your comments uh, in the chat um, i would like to thank you again uh, to, to thank my team again who organizes this series especially federico boschetti paolo monella tiziana mancinelli and um, linda spinazzi uh, and this uh, seminar is being recorded. You can see the, the red button in the left upper corner. So please be aware that everything you contribute to the seminar will be recorded and uh, the uh, presentation and the discussion will then be published online on the, our YouTube channel. Uh, all the resources connected to the seminars in general, and this in, uh, in particular, are interlinked and provided on our GitHub repository. Uh, everything is interlinked from our website and then from our GitHub repository. Yeah, that includes also this, uh, today's slides, so don't uh, worry, you can, uh, will be able to check all the materials created uh, by Mary Redmond today. Um, I, I'm now very happy to introduce you very briefly uh, to uh, Mary Redmond. Uh, she has a, a long uh, career uh, already, so I could talk for several hours, so I will restrict uh, myself to some highlights. So Mary Redmond is from originally from Trinity College Dublin, where she uh, was a professor for computer science and the director of the Master for Science in uh, Multimedia, which ran for almost two decades. She has been engaged uh, in a long-standing friendship with uh, Kafoskari and the Department for the Humanities and is uh, currently a visiting professor at the Venice Center for Digital Humanities. She's teaching for several years now the Master in Digital Humanities and is involved uh, now in the design and the first uh, edition of the new Laurea Magistrale, which is a um, fully-fledged master program. Uh, um, and. Uh, she is teaching various models on critical thinking and creative entrepreneurship. In the past, uh, she has always been working at the interface of technology industries, 
the academic teaching and uh, research, and in the second part of her long career, in numerous uh, projects uh, in collaboration with cultural heritage institutions. Uh, she has been a lecturer and research affiliate uh, at the Mississippi technology, the famous MIT uh, near Boston, uh, and she uh, founded her own company, so X Communications Limited, uh, designing and developing digital media applications and acting as the managing director. She sold the company in 2013. Uh, until present day, uh, she is chair of, uh, of the advisory team of This uh, is Pop Baby, an Ireland-based association to organize theater shows and festivals and much more. Uh, she is a board member and chair of the Rough Magic Theater and of the Dark Light Film Festival, has been a judge in the Dublin Fringe Festival, uh, of the Trinity College Science Gallery from 2008 uh, to 2016, which then developed into a European initiative, uh, one branch of which has been recently launched at uh, Kafoskari at uh, Zattere. Uh, and uh, she created a series of public lectures in partnership with the Science Gallery and the TCD at Trinity College Dublin Long Room Hub. Uh, she was involved in the curation of international installations and exhibitions, and this is what she will uh, also be talking about today. Uh, the Samuel Beckett Manuscripts Exhibition, the Irish Civil War Exhibition at the National Museum of Ireland, Leonardo da Vinci Codex Exhibition at Chester Beat, the Library James Jotilis at the National Library of Ireland, and the Franz Bacon Studio in the Hugh Lane Gallery, also in Dublin. Um, the title of her talk today is uh, Creating Interactive Narratives in Cultural Her uh, Heritage, uh, in Cultural Contexts. Uh, and yeah, we look forward to a very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. And afterwards, everyone uh, is invited to engage in a discussion with Mary on uh, a presentation. Well, thank you very much, Mary, for being available. And, and the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Franz, and uh, thank you for the invitation to the team and for their support today in trying to get my slides online. So I just want to apologize at the beginning because I have to ask Tatiana to change the slides for me. So um, I go back to uh, next slide, slide, please, so you understand I can't do it for myself on my machine. But I want to welcome everybody and um, thank you all for attending, which this wonderful online uh, series of seminars, which I think it's been really good for me to keep in touch with everybody in the group. And I really, I really welcome uh, our biweekly meetings and discussions. And I think in the current time, that's been so helpful. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. So, there's a cat on the feed. <laughs> Can you see? Um, so today I want to talk about uh, some of the work that I, I have completed in working with cultural institutes. Um, thank you for the introduction, Franz. Um, uh, I have had a very varied and long career. And this is something that I have um, been working on in the last 15 years, working with different cultural institutions. But um, what I wanted, the, the way that I got into this work was I had a research group in Trinity, which was called uh, uh, Interactive Digital Media Research Group. And we were working on lots of different projects and uh, different galleries and museums and creative people came to ask us to help them. And out of that, um, it became so popular that I formed a company. And um, X Communications was the company that I formed. And so we worked in lots of diff all, the, all the main cultural institutions in Ireland. Um, and one of the things, I had really never be, been behind the scenes of a cultural institution. So for me, it was very uh, eye-opening to realize that most of the artifacts that are in the, in the holding of cultural institutes 
are held in storage and they're never displayed to the public. Um, and uh, I can understand some of the reasons why some objects such as manuscripts, which are very precious and susceptible to damage from light, or very large objects can't, can't be displayed for all kinds of, of different uh, security reasons. But the thing that surprised me most when I was working in these cultural institutes is to understand that 90% or more, possibly more, of the artifacts and the objects that they have um, in their collection were never shown to the public. And I, I don't have any hard figures for that. Uh, I have talked to different people in the different countries about it. And a, a, an estimate would be somewhere over 90% of artifacts are held in cultural institutes and they're never shown to the public. So for me, this was a challenge because I, uh, I felt that I had some skills in technology that could change that slightly or make some of these works more accessible to the public. And um, after going to, next slide, uh, the, to see the Bayou Tapestry, which was, is held in Normandy in the north of France. Um, and I have a photograph there of it uh, on my next slide. Yes. <laughs> on my next slide, please. Um, it's an amazing tapestry and uh, it's, it's about 70 meters long. It uh, is on display in a purpose-built building. And uh, so 70 meters long means that the building is a long tunnel and this tapestry is displayed uh, the full length of this, this tunnel and then it curves around and comes back the other side. So, the cost of, of displaying something like this is phenomenal and prohibitive for most cultural institutes. Next slide. So another, um, another thing that I saw, which was going to see Picasso's absolutely wonderful, stunning um, painting of Guernica. And I went to see that in Madrid in the Re Reina Sofia. And uh, the exhibition space there again is purpose built and the, paint, the painting itself is, is huge. I can't remember the dimensions of it, but it's enormous. And beside it, there is a gallery which shows all the constituent drawings that Picasso did that he then later included in this uh, wonderful work. So looking at <clears throat> the cost of showing works of this exceptional scale is prohibitive for most, most cultural institutes. So that's... Uh, that's re Next slide, please. That's really interesting to think about because digital technology came along in the 1980s and um, with the digitization of all forms of images and uh, texts, museums and galleries started to move to collecting, started moving their collections. They started digitization programs and started moving their collections online. And that's been happening for quite a while. They also have started using all kinds of digitization tools and presentation tools, including virtual tools, to enhance the visitor ex experiences of going to the galleries. So what we're in a, a situation now is where the museums and galleries are exploring um, lots of technologies and um, they're using them in a mix to mixed results, really to mixed results uh, and how they enhance the visitor experience and how they tell the story of the objects that they want to show to their visitors. And I have visited a, a lot of different countries and I go to a lot of different uh, uh, exhibition places where they're using technology because I like to keep up with it. But the question that comes back to me every time is, will a visit to a gallery or museum be replaced by an online experience? Will going to see the physical object or going to the, a place where there's a context for those physical objects, how, how will, that, will that be replaced by an online experience? And the bigger question is, do we want to do that? So the next slide is showing you sort of like the top 10 of online museums and galleries around the world. 
where they have put huge resources, and I mean really huge resources, to creating online presences. Um, obviously, the Getty Museum has, you know, a big presence online. Vatican, lots of different places in the UK. The UK, the Reich Museum. These are. I'm, I'm not going to go to to any of these, but the links are here to allow you to go in and have a look at these 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 different websites. Now, what it takes to build a really successful website presence is is a huge cost. It's a really huge cost if you're going to do it properly. Now people think, oh well, it's going to be cheaper for me to to show my artifacts online rather than than show them in the physical presence of my gallery or my museum. But the truth is that it's very expensive to create these effective online platforms. And uh, a lot, most galleries and museums just simply don't have the resources to do that. So um, I want to talk about some experiences I've had, and they're all in Dublin, obviously, because that's where I work. Um, and they're in relation to making creative work uh, in a gallery or in an, in, in, in an educational institution available, more available to the public. Because currently, these objects or these notebooks or manuscripts ha have not been accessible to the general public. So the first project I want to talk about is Francis Bacon. Uh, next slide. Francis Bacon is a very famous painter. And he was born in Ireland, but he emigrated to England when he was uh, 17 years old. Now, I don't know anybody if you're familiar with his work, but his work is, you know, as painters go, he's, he's one of the most incredible painters that I've seen. And so Francis Bacon, in terms of where he worked, he worked in London, most of his uh, painting career. And he worked in this tiny building. It's a small muse up in Kensington at the back of a very busy street. And uh, that's a picture of it uh, where he, currently. So just to explain, it's, it's, a really, it's a really constrained space. And originally these buildings were not built for human habitation. They were built as stables or they were built for, for cars. But as London became more and more densely populated, these buildings became very uh, attractive for people to live in. So this is where he lived and worked for 30 years. Next slide. And this is, uh, when we looked at that image just now, uh, if we looked, he worked and lived on the first floor not on the ground floor. The ground floor was used for something else. So this was his studio. It was a small space, and this is where he worked for 30 years. Now, I'm not showing you, this is a photograph of the studio when it had been deconstructed and brought back to Dublin. So it's a pretty incredible space. And uh, what happened was the estate of Francis Bacon, when he died, donated this, his studio to um, a gallery, a big gallery in Dublin. And they sent uh, architects, curators, photographers, and they only had two weeks to go in and take all these objects out. So they went into this space and they worked, they noted every, ob every object in it, and there was between seven and 8,000 objects in this room. And they noted its dimensions, exactly its location, it's X, Y, and it's, it's height location, and then it was catalogued, and then it was put into a very safe way to bring back to Dublin. And they brought this back to Dublin, and they reconstructed the studio exactly as they had found it in London. So this, my, my part in this project was to make this studio accessible to people who are interested in Bacon as a painter. And the importance of Bacon working like this cannot be underestimated because a lot of his work is not, uh, it's, it's, it's mostly portraits, portraits of people, port anatomy portraits, but they're quite small. And when he, when he do, does a large, large uh, piece, it's either a diptych or a triptych. And the, lot, the reason for that is that that because he worked in such a constrained space and he had to go up a very narrow stairs to get up there, he could only work in a certain size of canvas. So the studio is vital to understanding how, how Bacon worked. And then understanding the objects that he had around him. 
was a really important to explain to, to, to people who admire his work. So we worked with the curators for a long time in building a database. So database technology came into this project where we built a database of all the objects in this room. And that was quite a challenge because um, some of the objects are obviously, they're just all layered on top of each other. And they're mostly discarded paintbrushes, tubes of paint, pages from books. So he had this curious habit of if he was reading a book and he liked something in the book, he, he just tore the page out of the book and put it on the floor. And when we came across this, there was a mound of 3,000 pages from books in one pile. So what our challenge was to try to you know, show those images, the pages that he had drawn from, that, that he had extracted from books, and tell people you know, what they were, what that image was. So with photography and digitization, we were able to do that. So next slide. So I built some workstations, which are all around the outside of, the, of this reconstructed gallery. And this is a, a picture looking into the space that exists now. It, it's exactly like that. But obviously, um, people can't go into it. I mean, it's, it's hard to understand how Bacon went into it when it was alive. So what it is important is to be able to go around the perimeter and look in and to see these objects and to look at, you know, like the absolute chaos that existed there. And when any, any time when Bacon was asked about his studio, he said that he loved the chaos. The chaos made, gave him ideas and created images in his mind. So in order to make sense of this, we worked with the curators to, uh, next slide, to come up with some you know, key parts of the studio. So this, for instance, this mirror was very important because it, it's something he, he always had with him and nobody knows, but it's possible he made this mirror himself. So because the space was so dense and we were using touchscreen technology, or even if you were using a mouse, it would be impossible to go through the different objects. So working with the curators, we picked out what was really important. And then we brought the, the visitors into that space to tell them more. So things like if you, you know, if you, if you pressed on the mirror, next slide, um, or this death mask of William Blake, uh, it tells the story of that. So the story, we told the story right beside the studio that would help people who came to see the studio and you know, were absolutely stunned at the craziness of this space to understand how this was actually the key to understanding Francis Bacon's work. So we, we did that. Um, in terms of photography, like the 3D objects were very easy to, uh, to pick out, but in terms of the photographs, like two-dimensional objects, he had very serious photography uh, collections. He had his famous, uh, his favorite photographers, and uh, he kept collections, he asked, he commissioned those photographers to photograph people, and he often made his paintings from some of those photographs. And uh, he had portraits uh, of, of his friends all taken. Some of them were, next slide, um, really famous, really interesting pe people. Lucien Freud was one of his friends, for instance, that we probably would have heard of. And you know, what, what Bacon did is if he had an image and then he fell out or didn't like the person who was in the image with his friend, he just simply cut them up. So, you know, what was fa fantastic was to be able to, to, to show all of those details. And um, he worked a lot from photography because he painted everything in the studio. So if he wanted to, you know, here's an example on the next slide uh, of him taking different images. He was, he was fascinated by anatomy. And for anyone who uh, has any knowledge of uh, Bacon's work, Anatomy was, you know, his amazing, his amazing skill drawing the human body, and uh, his his paintings uh, have this, you know, incredible uh, feeling of movement in them. So, showing all the photographs that he used, 
showing the references for all of his work and helping people to understand, you know, his work in this amazing way. So that was, uh, that was a fascinating project. And um, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's a very bad image of the kind of spaces that we created beside the studio where we wanted, well, the idea that I certainly had was that this was a very quiet space. So we had no ambient sound, no talking. It was, a, it was like a library space. So you could sit down and understand what you were looking at and the importance of that space to this particular artist. So we used fairly ordinary, you know, sort of touch screens, audio, one, audio ones and no ambient sound, quiet, quiet space. And, you know, it's quite a frightening. I mean, when I asked that question earlier on, is it, is it the same to see something online as or to, to experience something in a physical form? Well, I think when you see this studio and you're sitting looking at it in the quietness of the gallery, nothing can compare with that because it's quite stunning. It's quite frightening. Uh, and we were, we were able to create about at least three plus hours of content uh, showing the different objects and allowing the users to move through that physical space while being outside and being able to see it. So that was one of the projects that I wanted to just mention today. So next slide. Uh, the next one, of course, is, uh, is about James Joyce. And um, it's, you know, not, it would be strange to be Irish and not to be fascinated with James Joyce. And therefore, I am no exception. So, um, I got asked to work on a, a huge exhibition to celebrate the centenary of uh, Ulysses. And uh, Ulysses was written in uh, the late, uh, whoops, uh, go back. It was, um, it, it was written about a day in Dublin. And uh, this day was the 16th of June, 1904. So this was a very, very huge exhibition celebrating a hundred years of Bloomsday. Um, and that's a famous portrait of James Joyce. But as research for this project, I, next slide please. I came across the notebooks that James Joyce kept when he was writing Ulysses. Now these are notebooks that are owned in the National Library of Ireland. And James Joyce was a prolific note taker. So he had these scientific notebooks, which were probably the cheapest notebook that you could buy at that time. They were A4 in size, he carried them around with him, and he wrote in these notebooks details of ideas that came into his mind. So in this instance, if we could go to the next slide, they're just words that he wrote down. And I'm going to explain to you the coloring in them now in a moment. But if we go to the next slide, Yeah, we'll see something quite astonishing. So this is a, a double page, a folio of, a no, of one of his notebooks. And this has sentences in it. So he's written sentences in it. And uh, he's gone back later and he's used crayons, children's, he used um, cheap children's crayons. You know, the small packets you can buy with five or six crayons in them. He used crayons. And um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we can see more examples of him using these crayons. So these crayons, different colors, and very importantly, they're different colors. And so how this worked is that Joyce wrote these notebooks. He was prolific at writing in these notebooks and he kept them. And then it, when he went to work on Ulysses, he sat down and he opened his notebooks and he went back and he extracted words or sentences or paragraphs. And then depending on what part of the manuscript he put it into, he coded it with a color. So when he was looking for more material, he would go back and he would uh, see what he hadn't used and then use, perhaps use it. And then he would mark it with this coloring system to say, what chapter of Ulysses or what part of his, his uh, manuscript draft he put it in. So when I saw these notebooks, I was completely enthralled by these. 
I had never heard of them. Uh, these are images that are widely available on the web and there's many more of them if you want to reference them. But to me, Ulysses took 18 years to write. And 18 years is a long time to write a book. It's a big book and it's a very complex book. But to understand his creative process was utterly fascinating to me. Like, I say this in, in relation to Francis Bacon also, because with Bacon, we, we looked at his studio and his methods, his methods that he used to create his paintings. So here is a writer who mostly spends his life in cafes, drinking, and, and this is what he's doing. He's writing these notebooks. So that was research that um, I was able to do for this project. And then I had to come up with different ideas for interactive installations to make Ulysses more accept accessible to people. Because one of the problems that people will always say to you is, I got about 100 pages through it, but I couldn't get any further. So people, a lot of people have difficulty with, the, with understanding Ulysses. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this was the opening piece that we did. And uh, I worked with an amazing mu uh, multidisciplinary team. I worked with an amazing designer to come up with this concept where we, we looked at relating the physical spaces in Dublin to the different chapters in Ulysses. So this allows you, because it, it's a book that takes place over 24 hours and there's 18 chapters so it starts early in the morning and it ends at night. And it's almost chronologically linear, although there are some um, instances where it overlaps. So in this instance, you could, I can't show you the interactive, obviously, but if you can get a sense where you could go into this wheel and it would move around and you could go and look at, say, one of the chapters and it would show you the places that are referred to in that chapter. So this was an, exp an exercise of relating Dublin, which is the key to this book, and showing the places that, that uh, James Joyce was, um, was, visit was talking about. So another one that we, we, we did, we did five different uh, stations around this exhibition. So this, the sound of the text in Ulysses um, when I gave up on Ulysses after reading, I don't know, half, halfway through it, I went to listening to somebody else read it. And Ulysses is a, is a book that was written to be heard, not necessarily to be, to be read, but to be heard. It really is beautiful to listen to it. So, and it refers to lots of different music. So we came up, we did a lot of research into the, into the different uh, um, places and related music to those. And we uh, did a, a whole interactive series of workstations on the people that were uh, and making relationships between the characters and the songs and the place in the book. So another one we did was, um, the next slide, is looking at the characters in Ulysses. There are many, many characters in Ulysses. But there's something like 188 characters in Ulysses. And some of them are minor, some of them are major. So we came up with this concept of visualizing the characters and uh, where they appeared in the book. So on the bottom, you can see there the, the 18 chapters and you can scroll through them and see what, what characters were in that chapter and what relationship they had to the other characters in that chapter. So that's another one we did. Um, next slide. Uh, this, this, this is about playing the music uh, that's referred to in uh, Ulysses. So we worked with the curators in the National Library to come up with original recordings that would have been the recordings that were being referenced. And we were able to digitize those and include that into uh, an interactive station where <clears throat> you could listen to the music that was being referenced in the book. So again, uh, trying to make sense of this manuscript and the key important um, audio sounds in it. Another confusing aspect of, of uh, James Joyce's Ulysses is that there are many, many editions of it. 
and mostly to do with James Joyce's uh, um, <laughs> trying to extract uh, uh, advances from publishers, <laughs> which he was uh, he was very savvy at doing. So at first, you know, he had great difficulty publishing Ulysses. It was rejected by many publishers until he met, uh, you know, the Shakespeare and company, and they published it in 1922. But then he went on and, you know, created relationships with other publishing houses to publish, um, to, to publish different versions of it. And so again, we, we visualized that. We looked at all the different uh, editions that are in print or out of print or were, and, and showed, you know, the, the background details to all of those. So, so that was a fascinating uh, work for me to do. It, it was on view in the National Library for a few years, but it's now permanently, all of these interactives are permanently installed in the James Joyce Center. And um, they, they're still run today. And uh, it, it was, you know, it was a great privilege to be involved in that exhibition. So the next one I want to talk about is Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Lester, which I'm sure you all know about. I thought it would be interesting to talk about something that wasn't Irish, but did come to Ireland for a while. So it's again back to notebooks. And if I have one theme here, I bring between each and every one of these ideas is I want to look at the background, the creative practice that these artists used. Are, are they, you know, how they worked on a day-to-day -day basis. So the Codex Lester uh, is a notebook. Again, it's, uh, it's like a scientific notebook. And Bill Gates bought it for 30 million or something. But he lends it to different galleries and institutes around the world. And oddly enough, he lent it to um, a gallery that I work with in Ireland. And so it's, it's got a lot of restrictions on how it can be shown. Because once again, it has, it has, uh, it's very delicate and it can be damaged very easily by transport, by light, by heat, by, you know, so it's, it, it, it's a very precious object. So could we go to the next slide? Great. So <clears throat> this is the way, this is actually a photograph of the, the stations that I created over the gallery. And then behind that in the, in the background, you can see some of the cases showing some of the folios from the notebook. Now, what I think was confusing for people who were coming to this exhibition was that the notebook was shown as, not in its entirety because it wasn't bound anymore. It was broken down into these folios. So could we go to the next slide? So again, we went in and we, you know, told the history of the Codex Lester. We talked about how it was made and then how it relates to Leonardo's life. And next slide. And then we, we came up with a visualization of, of how it was put together. So if you look at there's it's 36 pages. So they're folios and they're, they're all, you know, they fit into each other and then they're bound. So when you look at it in the display case, Next slide, please. You see the folios, and it's confusing because you're maybe looking at one in a case, say in case five, you're looking at a folio, page 32, and page five is opposite it. So we wanted to, we wanted to make sense to the visitors of how this book you know, was originally put together and why they were watching, looking at these pages in a very different sequence. So next slide. So again, you can go in there, you can go and look at something um, in a, a folio that's an actual folio that's on display. Now, the other restriction on showing something as precious as this was it, the, the amount of light it could be exposed to in any one day was severely restricted. So it could only be illuminated for a few seconds in every hour. So when you went to the exhibition, you could see, you could go and look at the cases, but the case might be dark. And then the lights came on at another case. And so a little bit like musical chairs, jumping, oh, look, the light's on there now, then it jumped. So, so this was a way to try to give access to people to look at the details on this, on this manuscript. So next slide, possible. So here's, here's an, an image, an, an image of, of the notebook. 
So it shows you, again, a very dense notes, really dense notes being kept by, by Leonardo. And the fascinating thing about his notebooks is that his, illust his illustration skills were just so superb. So he goes and he illustrates what he's talking about in, in, the, in the, the margins. And these illustrations are, are absolutely wonderful. So in the, this, is, this is the next slide, which is trying to relate this, this to the time frame uh, of Leonardo da Vinci, which is, uh, f I think it's 1492 to 19, uh, 50, 1452 to 1519. So where in his career was this notebook? So again, this was taking a very, a very precious notebook that uh, is rarely seen. And even when you see it, you can only see it in such limited circumstances. So putting this information beside the original object, making this for that exhibition and allowing people to access the information because it made sense to them rather than just seeing these different pages, you know, randomly illuminated around a room. So that was fascinating. And if you, you know, you could go into any one folio and zoom into it and have a look at the detail in, uh, in, in the drawings. And, and the drawings and the illustrations are absolutely incredible. So that was a project that we did in, uh, in Dublin in, uh, when Bill Gates loaned it to um, the Chester Beatty Library. And uh, then they can never show that uh, interactive material again gone. That's part of the conditions. So there were very se severe restrictions in that. So I want to talk about a project that I have been involved in for a very long time, which is uh, another manuscript, uh, not a notebook, it's a manuscript, and it's a book of Kells. And this is uh, a ninth century manuscript that um, is a translation of the Bible. And it is held by Trinity College. And there's about a million visitors a year to go and see it. This is photograph is not of the manuscript. This is a photograph of the room on top of the manuscript because the room that the manuscript is in is under such tight security and light restrictions. You, you know, there's no image of that. So this is the room that you go into after you've seen the actual uh, one folio from the manuscript. So this is, this is a project that I initially started with the librarian in Trinity when they asked me to digitize the Book of Kells. Um, when they, they asked me that, I, I was quite surprised because I wouldn't be, you know, a medieval manuscripts would not, or sorry, a, a, a illuminated manuscripts would not be my specialty. But uh, over the years, I've got to know a lot about the Book of Kells because I've been working on it for 15 years now. Can we go to the next slide? So, <clears throat> I have developed several interactive versions of the Book of Kells. The first one I did uh, was on CD-ROM, which will tell you it was in the early 90s. And uh, the next one was on DVD-ROM. And then the one that I currently have published is in the App Store. So this manuscript has, has never had, was never accessible to the public. Uh, it was published in facsimile form in the 1980s by a Swiss uh, facsimile publisher. And they, they took the book and they spent two years photographing each of the pages under extremely uh, secure and very restrictive condi conditions. So the Book of Kells has 680 pages. So that's a big manuscript. And digitizing a manuscript of that size is, is quite a formidable task. Um, lots of people told me that I should just, you know, publish it and I should just show the pages that had a lot of illustration on them. And there were the pages that people always thought about when they saw the Book of Kells. Um, like in the next slide, um, there are some very famous uh, images of the book of, of, of pages of the book accounts. 
And in a 680 page manuscript, there are only 20 pages that are uh, illustrated to this level. So what you have is you have an enormous manuscript, which is just a translation of the Bible in Vulgate and uh, is not really readable to anybody because it was never created to be a working manuscript. It was created to be a, an object which was kept on an altar and made the monastery or the scriptorium look like a very important place because they had such a precious object. So, so really, you know, all people had seen were these images of, of the Virgin or Christ or these very famous images but that's not what the Book of Kells is about. The Book of Kells is about a huge manuscript with 680 pages. Every page, can we go to the next slide? Every page has some level of illumination on it. Not highly illuminated, but every single page has some illustration on it and, uh, and has some value because because it's the, the drawing on it is it's just it's just phenomenal, like the intricate drawing is phenomenal. So the task of uh, digitizing 680 pages, um, I went to Switzerland and after much negotiation, I got the huge 10 inches by eight inches acetates of each page and brought them back to Dublin and digitized them for the first time. And, uh, you know the amount of di the amount of space that this took up wouldn't fit on a portable medium, so that was a problem. And uh, you know, as 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 the space available on mediums has become more has become greater, it's been easier to work with this. But my absolute number one rule was if I was going to work publishing the book of Kells, I was going to publish the entire manuscript. I was not going to publish just the highlights. And so many people all over the world have contacted me about this application and told me it's too big. Uh, you know, I should, I should like give the first five pages as a taster and then sell the next, you know, the next images. But this was never, this was, this is a labor of love for me. It is not, I never did this as a commercial venture. I did it to make this work accessible to scholars. And therefore, the facsimile, when it was, the facsimile was published in the 1986 and 1,570 copies of the facsimile were published and they were sold individually for $18,000. So $18,000 means libraries, art collectors, very rich people. So definitely, uh, uh, people, the uh, facsimile publishers were not initially very happy with me publishing this, but um, I went ahead with this and uh, Trinity College were absolutely behind me. They wanted this to be published so that people could see it. So it's been, uh, it's been a great success. So maybe if we could go to the next slide. So one of the things we're able to do in an interactive medium, which we couldn't do in, in printed form or in a, uh, in a book form was there's there's a lot of different decorative themes throughout the book because there's angels there's different symbols of christ different eucharistic symbols different figures believe it or not that 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 face beside the figures there is a woman if you can believe that uh, that's how monks thought about women in the ninth century and um, so we were able to go in and create behind it a data you know we were able to call out all the angels and on what pages they were. So you could go in and then you could compare a, an illustration of one angel on, a, on, on one page and then compare it with another. So that, that gave huge, much more access to the content of, um, of, the, of the manuscript to, to people. So we go to the next slide. So the detail uh, that you can see, and this is just from a, an iPad version of this, the detail that you can see of each page is four times greater than the original size. And that's because we're working, I was able to work from very high resolution initial images that had been taken in the 1980s. Because this manuscript has, has deteriorated even in the last 
10, in the last 20 years, it has deteriorated significantly. And um, it's, it's thought now that it could never be photographed again. So, so these images are, are so important. Um, so you can go in and look at animals. It will show you an animal, a, a, any page that has an animal in it and describe the animals in that. And you can work all the way through this book. And, uh, you know, 680 pages, there's a lot of, there's a lot of viewing in 680 pages. And uh, I just wanted to show one image on the next, next slide, which is one of my favorite images, because after all these years, you have favorite images. And this is the devil. And uh, it's the only instance in the whole manuscript where the color black, black is used as a color. And that's their image of um, the devil. And next slide, please. This is an image which shows that although they were very uh, devout monks, they actually had a sense of humor. And there are certain things in here, there are some things in here which are uh, quite bold, which I actually, I, I could tell you about privately, but not, not in a public lecture that's being recorded. Um, so for instance, you have here like two feline animals with mice and the mice are playing with the host. The host appears all over this. So here, the host is just a plaything for the animals. And, and this is in a very small detail of one of the illustrated pages. So when you get to see those images, when you get to see the images like that, you realize, uh, wow, there is so much more in this manuscript than I ever imagined. You know, like for me, growing up in Ireland, going to Trinity College, hearing about the Book of Kells all the time, I had, I had an expectation of it. But when I got to understand it and to see it and to, and to learn about it, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it's a whole, whole, so different from what I, I had imagined. And, it, and that's, that's a project that I've got immense pleasure out of. So um, I, hope, I hope to give up working on the Book of Kells one day, but it hasn't been possible yet. Uh, and I just have included two more slides here. Uh, and that would be the next slide. Okay. And so it's just to sort of round off my talk and to say that this slide is a slide from a notebook of Samuel Beckett. So Samuel Beckett kept the exact same notebooks as James Joyce. Well, of course, they were friends. But he, he, he used the same methodology. Well, not quite as visually uh, stunning as Joyce with the, the crayons, but again, he wrote down in, in the notebooks and then he went back and he used them. And uh, the next slide, the very, uh, Beckett's notebooks are now in uh, the manuscript department in, in, in Trinity. So I have created uh, uh, an interactive version of these so that scholars can go in and they can view these notebooks because the notebooks themselves can't, cannot be touched by anybody. So again, the notebook scenario, which is fascinating to learn about. And looking at uh, Samuel Beckett's doodles, he did a lot of doodling of heads and he was, you know, writing was definitely his talent, I would say. <laughs> so that's the work I want to talk to you about. Uh, and I just wanted to, maybe for, to bring up some discussion about that because I did this work when um, people called it interactive digital media, but now it is digital humanities, the digital and public humanities. Um, I have a concern for the future of cultural institutes, a future because funding is such an issue and is never enough and uh, they can never ever uh, exist without public funding. The other issue I have is an understanding the importance of, of experiencing our objects, original objects in different contexts. And I've been led greatly and influenced by a guy called John Berger. I'm sure you all know about John Berger, who's um, an, uh, an English cultural theorist and uh, also a philosopher. And he wrote a very famous book in the 70s and he did, uh, he did a series for BBC and it's called Ways of Seeing. And so he came out with some really amazing ideas about how you see something. 
utterly impacts on how your experience uh, of, of that object or that painting or you know whatever of that space. So this is where I worry about. I worry about that creating you know images of these objects or these writings online. I I don't think that they have the same resonance with the audiences, and and that's what's happening now. And content is being created digitally. It's not being created in a form that will be around for thousands of years. And if you look at now, if you, if, you, if you look at how people write, they write on word processors, word processors, they're not, they don't, you can't see the process of their writing. You see the end result, but you don't see the process of their writing. And to me, given my work in this, in this sphere, I felt, I felt very privileged to see how these visual artists and how these writers, how they actually work and to understand that, uh, uh, that process. Because that's how you learn. That's how I learn. That's how I would expect students of mine to learn, is to see that process. Um, and I, I have one other concern. My concern is about copyright. And I know this is a hot topic, but I, I feel very strongly that copyright is far too restrictive. And uh, it's too restrictive. And the original authors are not necessarily the people who get protected by copyright. They, uh, copyright can make lots and lots of money for lawyers, but it doesn't make, uh, necessarily make, uh, make funds available to the original artists. So I think that's, that's, that's an area that I worry about. And um, it becomes more and more of a concern as everything is being digitized and monetized. And you know, somewhere like the Getty Museum is taking, taking all these images created by other people and using them uh, as, a, as, a, as a commercial venture to make money. So um, I think we have to look at ways to, 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 um, to work around that. So I, I'll leave it there. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mary, for this very <laughs> impressive and very visual uh, festival of images and exhibitions. Um, so, and this we have to remind uh, our our audience: uh, you are at the have been at the forefront of creating such things, which now become more and more normal um, to create also interactive. Uh, exhibition in parallel to uh, exhibitions uh, that are um, designed in the traditional way. So thank you for this very deep insight into this, uh, Thanks. these projects that from, from the ninth century to uh, the, the heroes of uh, modern literature back in, in Ulysses. Um, we now have uh, enough room for all questions that arise i hope so and please post your questions okay. into it. you can open when you press uh, on the speech bubble in the upper right corner uh, just uh, phrase your or post your questions inside uh, the chat and i can then um oh that's a very that's a long questions no it's uh, a, an observation but yeah. a very uh, important um Kiara, yeah. yeah. Oh. So it's the same for music. Um, I believe there's a parallel between music when you're composing the music, like Bach or Mozart. Do you bear in mind the characteristics of the space where their co compositions were supposed to play, not necessarily where they were played, um, and uh, the space, yeah, the beauty of their music. And uh, thank you. Yeah. That, that's a really, really good, really good point. So you are uh, invited also to to uh, make your comments uh, um, um, loud, so by by voice. So if you have long, longer comments, uh, please just uh, leave a note in the chat if you would like to make a comment or elaborate on your question. Then uh, you can actually um, put on your microphone when you have the word. So that's easier. So we don't have to uh, read long long uh, statements in, in in the chat. So that's the alternative way. So please. Uh, take use of this 
option. Are there more immediate questions for Mary? If people are still... Uh, well, I would like to, to say hello to Mary. Ah, Carolina, yeah. Congratulations. I, I, I am so impressed because we have discussed about your projects, but seeing them is wow, it's very impressive. I, you know, I really love this area and I, I, I really enjoyed it. And also I am a very big fan of Francis Bacon, you know, that he died here in Madrid. So we have many artworks here in the city. Mm. And I really like this idea of um, applying these concepts that maybe we find in expanded cinema uh, through the literary uh, world. How can we expand all this universe around the manuscripts, around the literature in such an impressive way mm. in which, yeah, we, we see these hypermedia strategies and Really, I, I don't have any questions, just to say congratulations. Oh, thank and you. I love your work, really, Mary. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm not really doing it at the moment because um, uh, I decided not to do it for a while. I was doing it nonstop for about 15 years, and um, uh, different people are, are always asking. You know, I get asked to do it, but I say, no, I'm not doing that anymore. I, I feel I got a chance to work with, with my heroes and, you know, it's hard to come down from that. <laughs> so I have been asked to do other things and I'm like, mm, I don't know, no, no. Uh, Bacon and Joyce uh, and Beckett, they were, you know, that was more than I had ever hoped to do. So very happy to have done it. Well, if you want to go on, I will be more we'll happy some to do heroes. something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah we will, we will uh, present you some of our little heroes in Venice. No worries. <laughs> um, there's a question in, in the chat, uh, and she would like to know a little bit more about the tools and the technology you used to realize these projects. Uh, yes. Um... Well, first of all, the most important thing is to work with a multidisciplinary team. And um, as hard as I try to make my current students in the, the Digital Humanities Master's program understand that, they seem to be still resistant to that. So the collaboration is between the disciplines. And working in a multidisciplinary team, I would have creative people, I'd have uh, graphic designers, uh, you know, art history, uh, I would have sound, I would have video, I would have all these people in my team and uh, work together to uh, conceptualize how we were going to approach that project. In terms of technologies, one thing I I'm, I'm also feel um, quite strongly about is that I see a lot of technology now being used uh, for the sake of using the technology and that, that disappoints me. You know, it, it's possible to use augmented reality and, you know, uh, you know uh, people can wander around and uh, see objects that uh, are, are in a virtual space and, and, and make a connection with objects in physical space. But I think the really important thing is to do is to understand who is going to look at your work and what impact you hope to have on them, rather than thinking about using you know, the latest and greatest technologies, I think it's important to use technology that's appropriate to the subject matter and to be careful about picking that, you know, I would strip it, you know, I can think about lots of technologies I, would, I might want to use, but I would also think about stripping them back to the point where they make sense and they, they enhance the experience that the users are going to have rather than using technology for technology's sake. I mean, some of my students currently tell me about projects they're working on and uh, they're using a lot of technologies that I taught them, but I'm looking at the work and I sometimes feel, oh gosh, did I really, am I really responsible for this? Because it's, it's that use of, of, of using technology to show off the technology. 
the technology is just there to enhance the original content. So um, the most important thing is to understand the content, really to understand the content and to understand who's going to be the visitor or the viewer or the user and how you want them to interact with that content, what you want to teach them. And so technology, lots of technologies, you can just, you can just pick the technologies that you think will work. I mean, there, there are a lot of sound technologies. I think in terms of interacting in, in, in museums and galleries, touch is definitely the best way for users to interact. It's the most intuitive way if you want people to seamlessly interact. Then in, in terms of technologies, you're looking at you know, what, what are the different platforms that you're going to use. And there's lots of different platforms that you can use. Um, so it's, 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 like, it's like thinking what is appropriate to this particular artifact or to this particular artist. And then using those technologies sensitively rather than technology for technology's sake. Uh, I went to see the, um, the M9 uh, exhibition center in Mestre, which I'd heard a lot about. And I was <clears throat> very glad to go and see it. And <clears throat> I, I felt that there was a real absence. There was so much technology there, mostly linear technology, like videos, loops of videos, but there wasn't any sense. There was a great lack of, of objects, of objects, of artifacts to connect to. And uh, I, I felt that, that they were missing that dimension. I don't know if anybody else has any opinions on that. Has anybody else been Thank to- Thank you, uh, Mary, for this. I think uh, many of us have been there. I think that's part of the concept. So I think that was an, uh, a very uh, sorry, a deliberate decision to do it exactly like, like this, but uh, yeah. I, I I agree. So, but I'm I'm not to judge about Neither about the the success or yeah. <laughs> so, um, if no direct um, questions or comments in this direction, uh, there there is uh, Beth Fisher with a, a comment or a question. You you mentioned the the communi communicative aspect of of your work, uh, and um, she's asking about the process of working with curators and scholars who don't have tech background. So how do you set expectations for the balance of critical approach and technology for things like budget, maintenance, and production time? Well, that goes in a similar direction. Um, well, that's a very good question. Thanks for asking it. I mean, most curators that I've worked with have very limited under understanding of technology. But that's why they come to me, because I would give them advice on that. Um, so uh, budget is, is also a huge issue for working on these, uh, these in interactive installations, because it's very, exp it's very expensive. The work takes a lot of time and a lot of people, and uh, the digitization of it, you know, is, is, it takes... Digitizing the book accounts cost a lot of money and took a lot of time. So uh, in terms of working, I don't expect curators or, uh, art gal or directors of galleries to be on top of all of the latest technology. And therefore, I would be happy to advise them. And, uh, you know, one thing... One thing I, I feel very good about is that the Francis Bacon studio that I showed you there, uh, I, I installed that in uh, 2002. And I used uh, the technologies that were around then. And the director is always calling me up because everything is still working. And, and I say, well, you know, I don't think that was a very good business model for me because 20 years of being able to use the same, same machines and they've never broken down and you've never had any problems with them is a very unusual experience. And the reason that that, that happened is because we programmed, we wrote, the, we wrote all the programs ourselves. We wrote everything from scratch. We didn't use anything off the shelf. So I would work with a team of programming people, uh, creative people, and uh, I would... Uh, 
you know, benefit from all of their inputs and take all their advice. So uh, I don't expect technical people to be necessarily, my experience of working and teaching students are, it has been, people who are trained to be computer scientists are very scared of the creative process. And when you sit them down in a, in a room and you say, well, you know, tell me what your idea is, they go, well, I have no idea for that. But the same is absolutely true. If you look at creative people, people maybe who've gone to art college or studied sculpture, or, and they have no experience of technology. So they say, oh, I don't know anything about that. And it's like, close that door. I don't want to know anything about that. But to me, one of the most incredible experiences I've had is when I take people who have no technical background or have never worked. Like I was a person who went through a very strict scientific, I did mathematics. So for me to be interested in creativity, it, it, it seemed very strange. I, I, I was never, I, I did math. So I, I never wrote a word in English when I was at college. I just wrote in Greek. And uh, when I see those people, when I see those, those edges slip away, the, those people can become, the technical people can become incredibly creative and the creative people can really learn about technology very quickly. So the secret to doing work of this nature is to, to get together multidisciplinary people with different disciplines and have them work together. And that's when the magic happens. Um, that's been my, that's my experience. So I, I don't expect directors of galleries to be technically astute, but there's lots of people they can consult. Does that answer your question? I hope so. So otherwise, uh, the next uh, person Maybe. on the list is Serge Noiré. Uh, you have two questions which have partly already been addressed. If you, uh, Serge, if you want to put on your microphone and maybe share your question with the audience. Mary? Oh, oh, my microphone. Oh. Is my microphone on? Yeah. No, no, your, your, mic no, your microphone is, is fine. No, I, I was... Inviting uh, Serge Noiré to write oh, okay. on his uh, two questions. If you click on the microphone at the bottom of the of the screen, okay. if you okay. click on the screen, then the, the microphone. Hello. Hi. Hello. Voilà. Yeah, yeah, we Thank you very much for this fascinating <laughs> talk yeah. that uh, we've heard. I had uh, yes two questions, but one uh, we already engaged on was the the museum M nine. But my first question was just. Uh, uh, if you if you have done something of a website about your Ulysses of Joyce uh, project uh, exhibition, if there is something similar on the web which could be multimedia and that we could eventually see uh, uh, see online, and this is linked to to a third question, but uh, it's uh, linked to the idea of. Uh, um, archiving these yes. extraordinary work that you have done. What about their future, their digital future? What is the link with uh, uh, memory institution like national libraries or, or things like that? And uh, up to, Tom, to come back to the M9 museum, yeah, my, my question was, of course, because you said uh, repeatedly that uh, we need absolutely a physical experience and that the technology should underline when it's needed uh, some uh, other aspect of the narrative. But the idea of the MNI, it's, it's the idea that you have a physical place for a virtual experiment and um, you you have many different, you said linear, but uh, I've seen 3D, uh, you have uh, sounds, you have interactive, you have stats, you have photograph, you have uh, uh, cartoon, you, you have uh, a full uh, immersion in uh, the dark and the possibility also to uh, interact with uh, the teams that are offered to you. Uh, it's a totally different way to write the history of uh, uh, a country in a century. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I, yeah, it is, of course, technology, but uh, you, you have 10 objects, I think. 
but uh, what you really think this is uh, uh, something missing the object when the object is the virtual as such well uh, no i don't want to seem too critical of it i i think that there are objects there and you know there are immersive environments and you know part of it is very very is is fascinating but i suppose what i feel is that um i didn't walk away from that ex exhibition and feel you know any real connection with it which 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 is what i like to do um the space it, it was a very long exhibition the space was uh, quite demanding um, and uh, i think it would have benefited from some more objects being placed around in the context in which it made sense for them but in, in that, I was very, I'm very happy to see it there. I think it's great. It's a great reference point. And one of the things I find about working in Venice is that, you know, I, I have gone to see most uh, museums and galleries and all the time, and that their use of technology is, is, is very limited. And uh, I'm not promoting the use of technology, but I think there are instances where they could make some of the work more accessible to people. So, in terms of what you said about the, uh, make you know placing this work online, that brings you brings me back to my question of copyright. Okay. And that's my frustration. Like even for me to give a talk like this uh, about and so use some of the images, you know, I have to go back. I have to talk to people about it. Uh, if it's going to be recorded, I have to be very careful about it. I would have access to lots more. Uh, uh, content, but I'm not allowed to use it. So, and and in terms of uh, that being published on the web, well, the answer is it's not going to be published on the web because the Cultural Institute's protecting the copyright. When we did that exhibition with uh, on James Joyce, James Joyce had the most rigid copyright around his work that has ever been heard of. His grandson, uh, who has recently passed away, uh, employed a whole team of lawyers to make sure that none of Joyce's work uh, words were ever used in any other context. So when we put that exhibition together about Ulysses, there was no instance in any panel that we wrote in any of the content on the doc on the interactives where we would use five words that appeared in the same sequence as they appeared in Ulysses. Five words. And those words could be the definite article, you know, a conjunction. So being policed, that copyright being policed, I don't think that it does uh, any good to the author. Because that author, I mean, if you're an author, you want your work to go out. You want people to interact with it. You want them to comment on it. So copyright has become a real problem in this world and and publishing it digitally most museums and galleries they don't want to do that and, and that, about the archive archiving of your project no nope, they don't archive it in fact the original people sometimes come back to me and ask me if i have any uh, copies of the work because they just it. nice isn't it we have a question from paolo monella yeah, it's it's terrible. So yeah, we have to go into politics for this. Yes, I know. It, I know that having a question oh. from Manuela is terrible. <laughs> the way you framed it, we have a question from Adam. That's terrible. We <laughs> 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 you know. But amen to everything you said about copyright. By the way, that's a fight that we cannot forget to to, to fight. If uh, libraries, for example, pretend to have copyright over something that's been written by a scribe in the in the 12th century. Anyway, my question is on the original text and writing as a process. So the notebooks you showed, yeah. this reminds me of the fact, this shows us, I mean, uh, before our eyes, that uh, the original text doesn't exist, that the writing process, the painting process is a process, something comes from outside and gets moving. Uh, I think that this kind of editions, um, genetic editions of text and images are very good to change our idea of text. Um, I think that's another place in which image and text, so philology and art, cross mm. each other. Yes. Because there's no, I'm a philologist, but there's no distinction because the 
text is made and makes sense in the notebooks visually. And my questions are, first, if you transcribed those notebooks as well, and second, how did you model the relationship between images and text? Thank you. Um, uh, that's a great question. No, I, I have not transcribed um, the, uh, the words uh, on, on those notebooks. And um, I don't believe the owners have even done that. So, uh, the, the, the library. Um, have you been, yeah. have uh, you been collaborating? So it's, it's, I had the same, same question. Have you been collaborating or in contact with uh, those uh, great uh, scholars creating genetic editions of the work of uh, James Joyce and Beckett, so um, uh, Hans Walter Gabler and uh, Dirk van Hulle uh, for, as regards Beckett? Have you been in discussion with them or was uh, this asynchronic? <laughs> The, the, whole, the whole discussion around James Joyce all became very bitter because of this Stephen Joyce, his grandson, and how he shut down the copyright. Yeah. Uh, and there was a, the, there's, there's been similar problems with the Beckett estate. And it's very disappointing because these artists lived in poverty in their lives. And then, you know, they, they die and then their estate picks up the, the, the money, the, the fees. The copyright fees, and so they spent a lot of time making sure that the work is not is not shown or it's not used in any way, not to protect the integrity of the work. It's not to protect the integrity of that work. It's to to make money out of the copyright, and that that is that that's so disappointing. But the copyright of Ulysses uh, was only for seventy five years because that's the copyright law in Ireland, and uh, so that came you know, came to an end. And so it came to an end on just about the same time that Stephen Joyce, unfortunately, he passed away. But I mean, the amount of scholarship uh, that was stopped around James Joyce during that period was just phenomenal. You know, people doing PhDs, writing theses, writing books, uh, being terrified about food. So um, that's, that's, that's an issue. And for me, I, I, I don't really, uh, I, I, I still have a lot of um, work in the Book of Kells and I, I work with people in Trinity about that. And um, they, uh, they were initially, when I started to work with them, very, very sensitive about copyright. And they told me that I couldn't use every every page, I couldn't use every image, and that people were going to steal it, and they were going to copy it. And, you know, I come from a software background where uh, I've very much been involved in, you know, proprietary software versus open software. And I would be a proponent of open software. Whereas you can, you know, you can write code, you can make it available, and people can write better code, you know. so. What's wrong with that? If someone can improve the, that your work, so, so uh, the initial the initial work I did on the book of Kells was uh, to the background of being sued, just to let you know, <laughs> uh, and being being sued about using the images that were owned by by nobody really, because the the monks they're not around. Uh, the church gave it to Trinity, and they can't. They can't read. They can't copyright. They can't copyright those images. But they don't. They don't want anybody to be able to use them. And I. I mean, I understand that they should police the misuse of them. For instance, images from the Book of Kells appear in bars or on coasters for beer mats, and you know, in really distasteful instances. Or people make jewelry out of the inter interlacing uh, details and um, stuff like that. But who is to say that this is tactless or distasteful? And why, you know, so why go after people to try to police this copyright? Because it doesn't have any meaning. I mean, we have an excellent example of doing it the, the opposite, so to uh, share everything free online, like the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, so who, exactly. who really don't care about uh, people, who in, in, in the opposite encourage people to, to use the materials and to be creative with, with it. So this is a very nice example of, of the contra, uh, contrary approach. The right very in line with the uh, policies of, of our center. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, the Rijksmuseum have been like a, quite amazing about that. 
but uh, you know there are other estates of of different artists who spend their whole time going on yeah and and that's yeah. i don't think that that's really paying respect to the original art There so, are two further questions by Laura Catalini, uh, one about accessibility, so also for um, impaired people. So if this is an issue for, uh, have, have been an issue for your, for your projects. And the other one, maybe Laura, you want to elaborate in this, if I understood correctly, it about the, the over um, uh, um, loading of materials online making accessible so that people might get lost is this so in in the in the context of COVID, many institutions opened up their materials so which was always welcomed by by most mm. of the people but if there is this may be a problem of too much information uh, too much, and hello uh, um thank I, you for the presentation uh, yeah. and i would like to add one more thing about the second part of the question uh so Please. Um, that question was to uh, uh, I wanted a, a link to a concept that we talked about earlier when uh, um, you mentioned the fact of you know physical experience being um, uh, versus, um, versus online experience yeah. so now it's kind of you know we kind of have to but uh, is this too much content or is this content really does this content really matter because like i've seen some videos but they're really plain like just with no explanation no guidance so i don't know um, are we using technology in the in in a good way or or what is your thought about on that well um thank you uh, I, I i i i agree with you that you know, people use technology for the sake of the technology without understanding the context or what yeah. they're trying to do and that that's, that's not good. Um, accessibility, yeah. yes, accessibility has always been an issue for me. And um, uh, it, um, you know, if you're going to put something into the public domain, you have to make all that information accessible. So yes, mm -hmm. I, have, I have worked with worked that. And in terms of doing interactive work, it would be, you know, the, uh, the accessibility would be around the, the height, the ways to interact, the size of the type, the, the, you know, replacing type with sound, all of that. Yes, always, always take that into consideration. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Maybe someone who wants to address also the open issues at the end of this presentation, but I mean, we covered most of them, I suppose. Okay. I look very much forward to working with you, Mary, so because uh, I completely agree with your uh, uh, opinion about the accessibility and the openness of software and data. So. And yes. as a scholar who works with materials, I, I really, I, I think I will do the choices of my next project. So if, I'm, if I find the time uh, uh, to, to work on an editorial project again, uh, I would only choose material that is uh, provided as or, or, or open for linked open data so that I can uh, um, design a project around material that is available so that I don't have to care about any restrictions and to adopt to legal issues that really destroy the, the intellectual or the, the uh, um, research um, approach. So that to, to fully benefit from, from data uh, that is accessible and uh, linkable to uh, mm. resources that we uh, shared. Um. So, as regards images and manuscript images, I mean, the, the hot uh, um, topic at the moment is, uh, is the triple IF, for example. So to, to use manuscripts or include into editions, uh, manuscript provided by research libraries and archives that are uh, freely accessible and uh, addressable. So to very small detail via the, the triple IF um, protocols. So that's, that would be, uh, so I, I would rather starting from the material itself i would rather look okay what's available in what format and then i can organize uh, a project around this 
because there's so much material in, uh, in medieval yeah. literature anyway, so uh, it's no problem to find something. Well, I, I, I really, I really, I to so totally agree with you because it's so frustrating to spend your time circumventing, you know, legal and copyright issues and it interferes with the work and um, it's a complete waste of time. It's, and, and there is a lot of work out there that doesn't have those restrictions and therefore it's more attractive to work with them. Um, on, uh, so that's what we'll do together. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? There's a comment by Tatiana. Uh, she saw Beckett manuscripts material used by the, the transcribus team yeah. so for text, hand, handwritten text recognition. So, but I mean, the, the manuscripts are dispersed across archives and libraries, I suppose. So it's yeah, confusing yeah. the situation. Maybe in this case, they are open. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, and you can see a lot of those notebooks, those images are used on the web. Um, uh, so I thought, I, I think for me it was fascinating to see the process of how the writers worked and how similar it was. That they, you know, you could, you could follow the, from the beginning, well, from the beginning right through to the finished work, to be able to see that. And, and I don't know if we're going to be able to do that in, in, in a thousand years. You know, if we're looking at work that was created today, will we have that same, you know, ability to be able to uh, look back and, 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 and use it? The Book of Cows was written, it wasn't written on paper, and that's, that's why it survived. It was written on vellum, which are very young calf skins that they stretched. And that's, that's it didn't deteriorate. Um, but we don't think about those things now. It's it's not consideration making work. How this how 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 will how will this be in a thousand years, two thousand years? You mean the, the, the digital born material, the creative processes that are in in digital work? I mean, no. Uh, you have to talk also with Tiziana uh, sooner or later. I was designing also a project of safeguarding. Uh, the the estates of uh, writers who uh, wrote on computers, some machines that are not running anymore. So yeah. there's a lot of potential also then to to create new uh, or to establish new methods, new standards for genetic or, uh, additions uh, based on material that is not accessible. Uh, immediately on, on the web or somewhere yeah. else in, or in which is archived in, in formats uh, hardly to to uh, open. Uh, yeah. Well, that, that's a very, very important work. And, and I hear lots of initiatives, people working on that. Um, but, yeah. you know, I know if you think about, you think about <clears throat> the analog world and you think about, techno, you know, the VCR and the beta and all that work that was, that was completely lost because, you know, when a new technology comes out, everybody's forgets the old technology and hasn't, you know, isn't interested in transitioning that content across different technologies. But it's it's so important now. That work is so critical because that work needs to be preserved. So there's Paulo. We have a nice final question from Paolo Peratello. So what is your most challenging yet fascinating project you have been working on? So that's maybe a nice um, roundup question. I think the Joyce project was very challenging um, yeah. for many different aspects of it. Um, challenging from working with curators who didn't necessarily want to share information. Uh, worrying about the legal implications of everything and um, that was definitely it was a fascinating project when when I could see the source materials but what makes me sad is those source materials are still not available to people to see I mean a new museum of literature has opened in Ireland and I was very excited about that it only opened a few months ago and um, 
it's in the building where James Joyce went to university. So it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, Joyce would be one of the authors I expected to see in there. And they have, they have one of the first editions, one of the earlier first editions on view. But all they have is a photocopy of one of the folios that I showed you in, in a case, at the back of a case. And I know that they, they, have, they have amazing material, but they won't show it to the public. And that's, you know, that's very disappointing. So um, I, I think that was, the, working on Joyce was definitely, definitely a fascinating project for me. And it took up many years for me. And uh, I'm very happy now that it's the work, that work still exists because um, it's the James Joyce Center has taken all those interactive pieces that I, I developed and they, they're still running today. And they still call me up when they have problems with them. <laughs> but uh, that was the most fascinating one. They call me up as if, yeah, yeah, I can just run up there now and fix that, yes. <laughs> uh, but the James Joyce project probably was, yeah, a favorite. Thanks for asking that. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Okay. Um, time. I think uh, it's time. Thank you very, very much for this uh, very highly interesting uh, insight into your, your work and the long, long career uh, and for this very inspiring and interesting discussion. Uh, uh, we keep in contact uh, the whole year, I hope, and I hope we will meet as soon as possible also in Venice again. But so, I mean, this is all Great. delayed. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, from the audience uh, for participating. We uh, run the next seminar in the next week already. So this will be by our um, um, fellow research fellow, Elisa, uh, Elisa Coro, and she will talk about water uh, and why water matters, uh, digital solutions for a better understanding of past extreme events. And, and this will be in collaboration with the Digital and Cultural Heritage um, uh, um, research center for digital and cultural heritage. So that's the new, uh, the new uh, name of uh, uh, what has been uh, research groups before. And um, she will talk about the interaction between human and natural uh, events evol uh, involving the Venice Lagoon and the countryside during the Middle Ages. And uh, she will uh, focus on digital tools for making, uh, for taking into account the human dimension, especially. So highlighting the history of a community and sharing knowledge and values. So I look very much forward to this um, next week. Same place, same time. Uh, as uh, announced, all the materials, in, including the registration of this uh, presentation, will uh, be very soon available on our GitHub repository. And everything is interlinked from our website. Thank you very much, Mary. Thanks. Enjoy. Thank you everyone for staying around. Yeah. And let's keep Enjoy the, the evening. Let's keep the seminars because it's it's a it's a real lifeline now in these times. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have an aperitivo in the evening yes. sun. You still have some sun. Huh? You are very much in the west. You are lucky. Yes. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Um,